we have a uh, privilege today to have an internationally acclaimed uh, researcher and professor. Uh, Dr. Cole is a huge advocate as well for women in science research. Uh, she has more than 70 uh, publications in peer review uh, journals, which is uh, a great achievement. Um, she is the Dean of Science at Ryerson University. She was uh, appointed to that position in 2012. And she's also a professor at the Department of Chemistry. We are very fortunate to have her lab here at uh, the Li Kaxin Tower. Uh, she is originally from the UK, uh, came to Canada as a graduate student, uh, uh, went to the University of uh, Victoria, uh, followed by fellowship in the United States, in the University of California in San Francisco, uh, and the, uni the University of Alberta. Uh, in, from, two, from 1997 to 2012, she was uh, a professor in biology at York University and associate dean of research. Um, uh, as I said, uh, in addition to the uh, peer review, the great number of peer review papers that she has, she is also author of several <coughs> book chapters as well and abstracts. So uh, we are very fortunate to have her talk to us about her main uh, research focus, which is on uh, molecules that transport uh, substances across the membrane of our cells, which this is probably one of the most vital functions uh, that our cell membrane does, which is permit transport of substances across the cells, the, the membrane of the cells, and it's extremely important for us to uh, have her talk to us about this so we can understand this better. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. That was a very um, generous introduction. I appreciate it very much. Um, so I'm the Dean of Science at Ryerson. Uh, I'm also a research scientist, and my research group is located on the fourth floor here. So I moved between Ryerson University and, and St. Mike's, um, and I still actually have uh, graduate students through York. Um, I was up there this morning. So um, like is often the case in science, uh, science knows no no borders, no boundaries. Um, it's a, a, an amazing community um, to be part of. So, so I'm going to tell you a little bit today about transporters in general. I'm not going to focus on my own research, but I'm going to talk a little bit about transporters because they tend to be a group of proteins that are not well understood or um, appreciated to the extent that I think they should be appreciated because I love transporters. So I'm a cell biologist. Um, I love the cell. The cell is everything. The cell is the world. For me, the cell is the universe. It, there is everything you need in a cell. You don't need to go beyond a cell. You don't need to go below into structure. The cell uh, can live by itself. There are single-celled organisms, or you put lots of cells together, you, you can get multicellular organisms. But the level of the cell uh, kind of tells you everything. So um, I have uh, come to um, decide that my career is dedicated to cell biology. Cells are fascinating. You're all familiar with cells. What are you, grade 11, grade 12? You're all in biology, 12 year biology? Yes? Yes, come on, talk. I'm not scary. OK, good. <laughs> good. So you probably know all this stuff, OK? Um, but you, so you know the structure of the cell. So the cell has got all of these compartments, all of these things inside that do all of the important stuff, the nucleus where the DNA is, the mitochondria, which are the energy factories. And it's all kept together, it's all kept inside, separated from the outside, by this cellular membrane. This big bag of lipid, phospholipids, which keeps everything contained. That phospholipid bilayer is made up of these big bulky um, uh, residue, big bulky molecules with their carbon tails. And it separates the inside from the outside. And it was really fu fundamental to the evolution of life was the appearance of membranes. If we can't separate the inside from the outside or separate compartments within a cell so that they can do different things, it's very hard to uh, um, have that complexity um, of a cell. The chemi chemistry of, of the lipid bilayer um, is such that the carbon chains create a very hydrophobic environment, so 
Uh, it repels water, keeps the watery inside from the watery outside parts. And the charged parts here, um, of the phospho parts of the phospholipids then, are hydrophilic. Water is fine, it's quite happy to sit up against this region, but you're not going to lose it across the membrane because the rest of that phospholipid bilayer is hydrophobic. So this is the structure of a membrane and it's essential if you're going to keep the insides of a cell inside. But cells are living things. We, need, we know that cells need stuff. Cells need glucose. You're all eating your uh, pizza there with your carbohydrates. It's going to break down into uh, glucose molecules, and your cells are going to need to get that inside in order for it to burn and create energy. So we know that some lots and lots of molecules need to get inside cells. Cells are also generating stuff. They're like little factories. Um, so in, so in order to get inside, then the, the, cells need, uh, the, the cells need some way to get that glucose from one side to the other. These, are, these things that get the glucose across the cell membrane then are sometimes described as specialized transport mechanisms. And before we knew what they were, all we knew about cells is that there were things that actually helped stuff get across the membrane. What I was going to say is that cells also produce stuff. That cells might make... Uh, steroid hormones or something that need to be released into the system, in which case stuff that is synthesized in the cell needs to get out. And before we actually had identified the proteins or whatever it was that did the work, we knew that there was some kind of specialized transport mechanism that actually allowed stuff to get across the membrane. So these specialized transport mechanisms then really provide a way for molecules that simply can't diffuse through this chemically challenging bilayer, this, chem this chemically challenging cell membrane, um, these specialized mechanisms allow these, these molecules to cross this very challenging environment. And if you're a tiny little glucose molecule, trying to get across this big lipid bilayer is as challenging as getting across a big valley there in the south of Italy or crossing the Thames. And so you need different kinds of specialized transport mechanisms to actually help that happen. Now, I'm showing bridges here because the concept is to bridge the membrane. But in reality, we're really, they're really more like gates. So there are specialized mechanisms, specialized proteins in the cell membrane that allow for molecules like glucose, other um, compounds, to get across, in, or out of the cell. And these structures also exist within membranes inside the cell. So anytime you've got a separation between compartments, you need a way to help things get across that barrier. And just as there are many different kinds of membranes, um, what have we got here? We've got different kinds of membranes. Membranes come in, in different kind of varieties, different flavors. This is a bacterial cell, so you've got a bacterial uh, inner membrane, outer membrane. Just as there are many different kinds of membranes, depending on the cell type, depending on whether it's a bacteria, maybe it's an um, uh, immune cell, maybe it's a, a brain cell, each cell or each condition or perhaps a developmental stage, the membrane will, membrane structure and complexity will change and the composition of that membrane uh, will change and the kinds of transporters that are present, the kinds of specialized transport mechanisms that are present in that membrane will also change. So, um, and the, the nature of those transporters will change. So, so I hope you're beginning to get the sense that there is a huge diversity of different kinds of transport mechanisms. Just as I showed you those different kinds of bridges, different kinds of gates, there are different kinds of transporters that sit in the membrane to allow things to get across. Now there are a few compounds that can dissolve and are soluble and can simply diffuse into or out of a cell. Little tiny molecules, maybe oxygen, can sneak between those phospholipids uh, and get in and out of cells. But many compounds like glucose need a specialized transport mechanism. They need a protein that sits in the membrane that maybe acts as a pore. It just creates a hole to allow that glucose, which is soluble in water but not in lipid, 
If you've ever tried to dissolve sh table sugar in olive oil, it doesn't dissolve, okay? So this is kind of like, it's a lipid, it's like olive oil. Sugar doesn't dissolve in that. So it needs a mechanism to get across the membrane. So it could be a pore, it could be some kind of multi-subunit, like different pieces come together to create a, a sort of a mechanism, a thing that folds or shifts. Um, there are transport proteins that need energy. They have to get some energy from the cell in order to make them open, close, shift. There are other transport or channels or mechanisms that use the inherent iron gradients, potassium, uh, sodium, that kind of thing. And then there are other transporters that um, will shift or will change shape depending on the kind of transport that they're doing. So there are all sorts of different kinds of transport and different kinds of transporters. This diversity of transporters is because these transport proteins are selective. So it's not a question of just having a whole um, collection of gates, the same kind of gate to let anything in that needs to get across the lipid bilayer. Different kinds of compounds have different kinds of transport proteins. So if we go back to glucose again, there is a family of glucose transport proteins, glucose transporters. And these glucose transporters transport glucose. They don't transport other compounds like amino acids or um, uh, hormones, peptides. They transport glucose. And those glucose transporters are very important in how we handle our sugar. So in situations of diabetes, um, in, they are responsive to, uh, or under normal conditions, they're responsive to insulin, and insulin will regulate how these glucose transporters work. Um, there are also transporters for amino acids. So if we're going to actually build proteins, build muscle, we're going to break down protein from the food we eat, we're going to need to get those amino acids into the cell so we can build more proteins. Then there are transporters specific for specific amino acids. And one of my graduate students works on a glutamate transporter that's very important um, in both normal cells, but also seems to be increased in the presence of cancer. So we think that that glutamate transporter might have something to do with why cells become cancerous. There are also transporters that are responsible for moving just ions or small molecules that are charged. So there is a whole family of transporters for different kinds of things. Glucose, amino acids, ions. My lab primarily works on transporters that transport the building blocks for DNA and RNA. So we work on nucleoside transporters, the complex, more complex molecule. Why do we care about this? Why are we interested in transporters? Okay, so I've told you that the cells need transporters because there are these uh, compounds that need to get in or need to get out, and they need some kind of specialized mechanism. But why are we interested in transporters in a clinical setting, for example? Well, transporters, these proteins that sit in the lipid bilayer, in the membrane, like other proteins that are sitting up here in this membrane, make up 30 to 50% of top drug targets. So what's going on at the membrane and the proteins that are present in the membrane are incredibly important in terms of how drugs work, sometimes how drugs don't work, sometimes how people respond to drugs, um, how effective drugs are, a lot of those factors are dependent on the transporter or other proteins that might be present in the membrane. So we need to understand transporters, figure out how they work, what they look like, um, and what their role is, particularly in uh, the um, efficacy of, of, of drugs, for instance. This um, figure or cartoon is actually a piece of artwork that was generated for a contest um, and it represents a protein called MDR. Does anybody know what MDR stands for? It's the multi-drug resistance protein. Okay, so the multi-drug resistance protein is a transport protein that sits in the membrane and it allows for the flux, that means the movement across a membrane, of many drugs. 
So here in this kind of graphic, here are the drugs, and here's the protein that is involved. Problem with, oops, wrong one. Problem with multi-drug resistance protein, as its name suggests, is that when you give somebody a drug, it could be an anti-cancer drug, cells respond to that um, impact by making more of this particular protein. And what this transporter does is it actually pumps drugs out of cells. Okay, so it, it contributes to cells becoming resistant to a drug. So we think of transporters as being good things because they can help us get drugs into cells or they can help uh, improve the efficacy of drugs. In some cases, transport proteins can actually be a problem because they're the reasons that drugs stop working as people become chemo-resistant. And this is an example of one of these um, problem drugs, problem uh, proteins. So the multi-drug uh, resistance protein or transporter was a, a topic of a lot of uh, study and a lot of interest because we needed to understand what it looked like, where we could find it, how could we regulate it, what were the other things that uh, affected its function. Because if we could understand that, then we could start to maybe look and figure out how we could actually deal with things like multi-drug resistance. Multi-drug resistance protein that is a member of the ABC transporters. It's a big family of transporters involved in, for instance, tumor resistance. But this family also includes members that are involved in diseases. So it's not just drug treatment. It can be problems in a transporter. A mutation can lead to a, a disease or a problem and other diseases. And drug discovery and drug development then is very much focused on identifying transporters, understanding them, figuring out how we can um, use that knowledge in order to improve drug development, drug treatment. So drug uh, transporters then are important as a mechanism for the entry and or the exit of many drugs. They can also then, uh, in some cases, like cystic fibrosis, uh, mutations in a particular transport protein can be, uh, lead to some kind of disease or some kind of problem condition. That's why we need to understand the factors that regulate transporters and control them. So some of the things that are done clinically then is to try and figure out how transporters actually influence drug action. So uh, this is sort of an example of a, a layout of trying to understand um, how much drug actually would be absorbed in a system, in a, in a human, how much gets metabolized, how much gets into a tissue. We need to know where it's actually um, being bound so that we can actually um, provide uh, accurate, sort of do uh, accurate um, dosing for individuals. And an example then of the, the importance of a drug transporter, um, for instance, in digoxin for heart failure, you give somebody the drug, there is a transport protein that is involved in taking it into a cell. Uh, there's also another efflux transporter that will pump it out, it's a, like the MDR transporter. Um, and based on understanding the pharmacokinetics of these proteins, and you can do a lot of pharmacology and a lot of modeling, you can figure out if you give somebody a dose, how much will be remaining in the blood and how much will be effective. What happens quite often is that uh, people will be prescribed more than one kind of drug. So let's say somebody's being treated for something uh, like heart failure, um, and they have a heart problem, but they also, so they're also being given an antiarrhythmic. So they're being given a drug to support the heart and a drug to keep the heart regular. The problem with this, dr with this drug is that it actually interferes with that efflux transporter. Um, and what that means is that instead of the drug being cleared out of the system, it actually remains in the blood and you end up with what could be an overdose. So, and this is quite a common situation where you have um, 
complicating factors or you have multiple drugs that, can, that a patient can be taking and then you can have um, interfering effects on various aspects of the metabolism or the way that the drug works and you can lead to very <coughs> adverse effects. So this is why we need to understand how a drug gets into a cell and sometimes how a drug is cleared from a cell. And these um, processes are very important um, in determining drug efficacy. There are other factors that are very important as well, not just the uptake because drugs get metabolized, they get broken down, they get turned into other compounds. Sometimes the active compound is actually a metabolite. They will be pumped out, they will be um, uh, excreted, and there could be other interactions from other compounds, it could be in things that are naturally in the body or it could be other drugs that somebody is taking. Added on top of that then is the fact that if you look at different parts of the body, there are different transporters doing different things. So in terms of trying to understand how your drug might be working, you need to understand your transporters in the different locations of the body, the target tissue or the, the place where the drug is metabolized. And this figure shows that in different tissues like the kidney, the cells that are bathed in the, in the blood supply have these kinds of transporters. They're actually organic anion transporters or organic cation transporters that will help take things into the kidney. There are a whole complexity of, of transporters that will pump things out of these cells and into the urine. So this is a way of clearing drugs. So there's a lot of work is done on transporters in the kidney. The other place where there's a lot of clearance is the liver. Nobody ever needs to go on a detox diet because you have been on a detox diet your whole life if you have a healthy functioning liver, okay? That is your detox right there. So the liver is full of these transport proteins. This is one place where you'll find the MDR, the multidrug resistance protein. And again, they are responsible for taking things out of the blood into a cell, possibly releasing things into the blood or into the bile. So location, location, location is really important in understanding how these transporters, which are the route of entry of drugs, um, how these transporters are going to work and how they might influence whether a drug works or not. And this is just another one to show you that it's a review that was all about drug discovery. So in order to to discover more drugs or to find new ways to use the drugs we already have, there's a lot of people working on all of the different families of transporters in order to understand how the drugs work, how we can make them work more effectively, um, and the possible um, contributing factors that may be the reason that they don't work. Again, it tends to be the um, the the liver um, and the, the kidney are places where you see a lot of transporters. The blood-brain barrier is a huge challenge um, because it's difficult to get drugs across the blood-brain barrier um, and it's a very distinct set of transporters involved in that particular tissue. Okay, so drug transporters, and we need to understand them because they transport drugs in and out. Transporters can also be the target of drugs. So it's not just getting things in and out. If you block a transporter or you inhibit it or you stop it working somehow, you can have a very profound effect on a cell or a tissue. And the best example of this is in the brain. Okay, so you all know what your brain looks like. Here's your um, executive function up here, your frontal cortex. This actually is a figure taken from a... Um, uh, talk on addiction, the reward, re reward pathway in the brain is quite well mapped out. Coordination back here, back, back of the brain, vision. Different parts of the brain have different functions. If we zoom in on parts of the brain, then you all know that the brain is made up of cells. Let's, let's nerve cells, but there are other cells. So here's a couple of nerve cells. Here's an axon. And these nerve cells talk to each other by sending signals down the axon to the dendrite of another cell. And I'll send a, a signal down there, and if we zoom in on that little region there, there's a synapse. 
okay? And this is how the cells actually communicate to each other at the synapse, at this little gap here, one cell to the other at the end of the incoming cell. There will be chemicals will be released from the, from the, the cells sending the signal, and there are receptors on the cell receiving the signal that will respond <coughs> to those chemicals. And a classic chemical, um, mood enhancing or a mood determining chemical, dopamine. Dopamine is a small molecule. It's released from a nerve cell. And there are dopamine receptors that when that chemical interacts with that receptor, sends a signal onto the next cell. So dopamine stored in the cell uh, terminus, signal, sending the signal, receptors sitting on the neighboring cell ready to, to see that lock and key um, effect and send the signal on. And there are a whole class of um, it, neurotrans... Um, well, I should, before I go on to the, trans the uh, drugs, following the um, release of the dopamine and the binding to a receptor, there's a one more protein family that sits in this region and that is the transporter. So in combination with the receptor, both on the target cell and the cell sending the signal, there are dopamine transporters. And what those transporters do is they clear that dopamine out of the gap here, out of the synapse, and they stop the signaling. So the dopamine binds to the receptor, sends a signal on through to the next cell, but then that dopamine is released and it's floating around. It could bind a receptor again and you could get another signal. Or there can be a transporter nearby which actually uh, finds that dopamine, takes it back into the cell. And it is those transporters then that are the targets for a whole variety of drugs that are used to treat a whole number of conditions. Go on to the next one. There are drugs that are used clinically, and there are also drugs of abuse, and they work through the same mechanism. So here we have uh, dopamine binding a receptor, sends a signal, and this funny looking thing here is supposed to be the transporter. It recognizes the dopamine and will take it back into the cell. There are drugs like cocaine that actually block the transporter and prevent that dopamine getting cleared out of the system. If you prevent the dopamine from being cleared, it just continues to build up and float around here. And it'll bind back to receptors, and it'll signal again. So you'll get binding, release, binding, release. And each time, you'll get a signal. What you want under normal conditions is binding, signal, release, and then clearing. And then the signaling is stopped. You don't want a continual on signal. You want on, off, on, off. But the problem is that drugs like cocaine, SSRIs, alcohol, block those transport proteins, and you get continual signal signaling. SSRIs stand for serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors. That is a serotonin transporter. Dopamine and serotonin do similar things. Um, and if you block a dopamine transporter or you block a serotonin transporter, you're going to get a similar effect, which is amplified signaling and a continued feeling, uh, enhanced mood feeling, which is why cocaine does what it wants or does what it does. It's why alcohol does what it does. And it's why SSRIs are used as antidepressants, because the aim is to elevate the presence of these feel-good chemicals, amplify the signaling, and elevate the mood. So drugs of abuse and clinically relevant, clinically important, incredibly valuable drugs target the same mechanism, which means there's a potential for abuse because they target the same mechanism and it's a fine line between um, uh, a, a medically um, relevant treatment and uh, moving into a sort of an addictive type of scenario. So transporters then are targets for drugs. Um, they're also the route of entry of drugs. The evolution of membranes um, meant that we needed proteins in order to get things across membranes. There are a whole 
variety of transport mechanisms, active, passive, energy dependent, iron dependent, um, multi subunit kinds of uh, uh, um, arrangements. So there's a whole um, variety of transport mechanisms to enable a whole variety of substrates to get in and out of cells. Transporters are very important in determining drug efficacy. Lots of work in this area and a very important um, personalized medicine. We know from our work that different people have very different levels of drugs that are involved in the uptake of anti-cancer drugs. So if you have somebody that expresses a lot of a drug transporter, they'd be a good candidate. If you have somebody who, who um, doesn't have very much of that transporter, they might be a bad candidate for a particular treatment. We, we really need to, to find out more about how we can use that information. Uh, transporters can transport drugs into cells, but also out of cells. So transporters can be a problem in the sense that they can be pumping drugs out and contribute to chemo resistance. And they can also be targeted by compounds, inhibitors, and modulate levels of um, other things. So I hope that going away with this, when somebody says transporter, when I say I work on transporters, the first thing people used to when I started, they used to think, oh, transporters, that's what you get on Star Trek. Beam me up, Scotty. Now people seem to think transporters, it's like running around shooting guns. I don't do any of that. So, so when you think about transporters, I hope you don't think about this, but you think about this amazing thing that this is this cell and how brilliant it is in, in figuring out how to get all of these things in and out of cells in a coordinated manner in order to, to have everything functioning in a way that makes everything work. And I just still continue, even though I've been doing this a long time, to find this absolutely fan absolutely amazing. Um, it's uh, uh, awe-inspiring, and it's also incredibly beautiful. I love cell biology. So I hope that's given you a little bit of information about transporters. I know it's not quite Friday, but thank you very much, and a ha very happy long weekend to everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Koldu. Anybody has any questions? You guys can ask us as many questions as you want. Yes, one here. Yeah. You mentioned towards the end that there, you might evaluate candidates' um, appropriateness for certain drugs based on the types and number of transporters. Yep. How does that, how do you go about that? So that's, that's a really good question. So um, there's the, the standard way that has not been adopted um, routinely clinically yet um, for the transporters we work on would be to, to is, has been to do the um, immunohistopathology. So you take a biopsy um, and then you, um, you make sections and you look under and you stain it with uh, either dyes or compounds or antibodies that will pick up your protein of interest and you look under, a pathologist looks under a microscope to see if there's a lot of it, a lot of your transporter or not very much of it. So it's the sort of, it would be has uh, anybody, any of the clinical people here in cancer, there's about like 12 different markers that are tested for, for instance, breast cancer, they'll look for estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, that kind of thing. You can add it to that list of things that you're searching for when you look at the, you look at the stained slides from the biopsy samples. Um, there are other ways now that are being developed which are um, looking for biomarkers. So you can take, again, a biopsy, or you could take a you know, blood sample for if it was a leukemia or a lymphoma um, and look for the presence of a, a particular biomarker. So it might disqualify certain candidates for certain drug treatments? Yes, and we already do that actually for the, for the, um, the metabolism, mm -hmm. for some of the drug metabolism. Some people have a, a variant of one of the um, drug metabolizing enzymes and if they, d if they have that variant they're not given the drug because it won't be metabolized appropriately. So. Um, so it's sort of um, profiling in order to um, identify good candidates. Right now, we don't have a really good handle on whether you have whether it, there's a correlation between having a lot of the transporter means you you respond very well, because there seem to be a lot of other things that determine whether the transporter is active <coughs> or not. So merely having a lot of it and having it sitting at the membrane doesn't mean it's turned on and ready to go. So that's what my lab does, is looks at the regulation of the transporters, yeah. And do, is there a lot of variation from one individual to another? Huge, okay. yeah, yeah. I, I have a slide that I could have showed you to show that some people have kidney cancer, you can have, even, even between um, 
I between individuals, um, some people can have very, very high levels of a particular transport protein and another individual can, can have none, and even between tumor tissue and normal tissue. So you want people who have very high expression, expression in the tumor tissue and very low in the normal tissue. If they have very high in normal tissue and low in tumor tissue, then they're a bad candidate because your normal tissue is going to get hit hard and you're not going to hit the tumor tissue. So. <coughs> The question is about the rate of transportation. Usually, which rate of transportation is faster when you have transported insert or channel, by voltage dependent channel? If compared. Um. So the, the, the voltage dependent channels or the receptor activated channels are probably moving their substrates faster than the mediated transport, whether it's facilitated or active. Um, just because the substrate is, is smaller and the channels tend to be bigger and sometimes non-selective. But it's, rates can vary considerably. So we do measure rate, um, but the channels are probably overall working faster. But the rates of transporters can vary enormously. Some of them can be very slow and some of them can, be, can have very rapid transport. So that answer the question. Yeah. It's a nice topic. Okay. So I'm now uh, wondering how do you understand that cell would develop a resistant job resistance system after the job delivery? How do you understand the mechanism? So the me so the the, the simplest um, explanation for the drug resistant cells is that the um, the cell you give the cells the drug, it gets in through a transporter of some sort, and it gets metabolized, and it, it the 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 MDR um, response is usually in response to a drug that creates um, a stress on the cell. So the the cell has a stress response, and then there are a whole variety of pathways that get activated, and the cell tries to respond to the stress as it would if it came across a stress in a normal everyday life. And one of the responses to that stress is making more of the protein that pumps that nasty thing out, sending it to the membrane, and then having much more of it in the membrane as a response to the stress. So you can, we can do this in the lab quite um, easily. You can grow cells. You can treat them with drug. They will transport drug quite nicely. Um, and then gra and, and particularly with the anti-cancer drugs that we use, you can kill the cells. So you can actually, you can figure out a concentration that will kill 50% of your cells. And you can, you can uh, figure that out, you can determine, it's very standard. But if you continue to give the, the cells a little bit of that drug for a long period of time, you'll see that that IC50, that killing curve, begins to shift because the cells are beginning to respond to the stress by upregulating <coughs> things that will resist the stress. So you get more of the protein at the membrane, more of the MDR protein at the membrane. <coughs> yeah? By cells right now, are you talking about the actual cells that are healthy or the actual cancer cells? So the problem in the clinic is that cancer cells, you're, you're, you're trying to target the cancer cells. Um, and uh, dr the so the, so the transporters that we work on transport um, compounds that are used for the, as building blocks for DNA synthesis. So cancer cells are rapidly dividing cells. They've got uncontrolled cell division. So they're making a lot of DNA all the time. They're making a lot of DNA. So they're good candidates to send a drug that gets recognized as a building block, gets into the cell, but has a little chemical change on it that um, causes the cell not to be able to make DNA. So that doesn't affect normal cells because they're not dividing all the time. So they'll take up that compound and they might get a bit sick, but they're not dividing all the time continually sort of out of control so they can handle the, 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 the drug. The cancer cells are dividing all of the time. They get this uh, compound in that's got this slight alteration and it interferes with their DNA synthesis and it becomes a problem and then there are pathways that get activated and the cells um, will die or they'll be or they'll slow down and then as they continually um, 
uh, metabolize or as they continue to um, sort of figure out what it is that there's a stress that's stopping them, they start to activate other pathways. And they, they, tr they try to, they recognize it as a stress and they try to overcome that by upregulating this multidrug resistance protein. So it is the cancer cells that become chemo resistant. This seems to be very, like, I mean, just so intricate and so beautifully uh, in, in harmony uh, in the cell metabolism. Uh, do you have any comments about uh, genetically engineered uh, splicing in our food, for example, genetically manipulated organisms being spliced in our food? Because from, from the fine balance that you're talking about with transporters, it would seem, and also dealing with cancer cells. And, there's a lot of controversy around right. GMO foods, whether they should be labeled, but it sounds like it could be creating very drastic uh, uh, consequences. Um, so I, I personally have no problem with GMO foods. I think if um, we are digesting our foods, we're breaking down into the components, and the components um, are the same, whether they are... Um, you know, whether it's a tomato gene or whether it's a flax gene, there's, it's still a DNA sequence that could be broken down or the proteins are going to be equivalent. So, Right. I don't think it has any impact on this kind of um, scenario. I think the, the transporters are transporting um, substrates that are fundamental. So it could be whether it's a... A protein, it's going to be amino acids. If it's a nucleoside, it's going to be DNA building blocks. Um, there may be other elements that um, are impacted, possibly um, ecosystem kind of um, levels of complexity. So the cell is one level com of complexity. The ecosystem might be another level of complexity that if you're shifting the response of uh, certain pests or certain insects, we call them pests because they get because we don't like them, um, then we do see some responses at an ecosystem level. There's actually a couple of people at Ryerson working on that with some concerns over genetically modified um, agricultural plants. I forget which ones. It does seem to shift the preference of some of the pollinators, and that's a huge, huge if issue because pollinators are what keep us alive, basically. They make our food for us. Very, very informative talk. Um, for your NPRs, is there uh, any current therapies that would modulate or reverse the the efflux of the MDRs, or at the very least, is there a way to just block those MDRs to allow your specific drug to right. continue? That's a really good question. Um, I I don't know what is done currently for treatment of chemo resistance. Um, whether there are, there may be new drugs out there that can actually um, target the MDR or the PGP family of proteins. Um, switching to a different drug sometimes is helpful because a different drug working on a different system um, will sort of confuse the cell. Um, but I, uh, I would have to go and see what the current state of the literature is. But it's certainly something that people have been looking at. So, I have one question. Uh, <coughs> it's a probably a very general question. But in, in, but in terms of gases, so you said oxygen goes in and out freely, probably yeah. because of a difference in concentration, yeah. correct? The other gases that are nitrogen, and just a little summary so that uh, I can understand that <laughs> as well. I'm sorry. Well, I, I'm, I'm always cautious about those kinds of questions because yeah, people yeah, used to say that sure. people used to say that about water, right? Yeah, yeah. Water diffuses water molecules. That little tiny H2O could just it could just sneak between those phospholipid um, molecules, and it, it would it made sense if you looked at the um, at the structure of the lipid bilayer um, that a water molecule in comparison to these great big phospholipids could just sneak through here. And th these are charged up here. This is charged, so you could, you know, you could kind of... Um, and then um, by accident, somebody discovered, and they couldn't explain why they were trying to study transporters, and they had uh, a solution there, and their cells kept swelling, and they, it, they couldn't explain it. And it turned out that there are water transporters. So there are things called aquaporins, 
water transporters. So there are actually transport proteins specifically for water molecules. And Peter Agre won a Nobel Prize for this. So it used to be water could sneak through. Turns out there were transporters. Um, most of the other gases, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, uh, oxygen, people say can sneak through. Whether, they are, whether there's mediated transport or whether they get carried along on other things, because sometimes uh, substrates can have complexes, um, don't know. But for the most part, the gases, nitric oxide and stuff, thought to be able to diffuse. I'll probably be wrong next year. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> That's the great thing about science, it's always changing, yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering, uh, with respect to the MDR protein, you said, you know, some uh, cancer cells can over-regulate that protein yeah. and over-express it. Uh, could you possibly maybe say train your immune system to recognize the overexpression and target it that way since drugs are so iffy to work with? Yeah, so I'm not sure that anybody's doing that with MDR because um, it, w it would be very difficult. But certainly immunotherapy, so sort of training the immune system to target um, other things on cancer cells. So these membrane, membranes, this is very simple, simplified, so membranes are very complex. So cancer cells will have other things sticking out from, from them. There will be other kinds of proteins with sugars on them and that kind of thing. Um, and training the immune system to recognize other components of the membrane. Um, as foreign and go after them is something that um, some people are looking at. I don't know if they're doing it for MDR. They might be, but it certainly is a strategy. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? I okay, have no. a, oh, yes. um, does our transporter profile remain the same throughout our lifetime? Is it something that's variable or is it, and in young, are children's more like each other's than adults? That's a really great question, and I think we don't really know very well that because transporters are not as well studied as other parts of the cell. So I would imagine, uh, I would guess that um, our transporter profile uh, changes considerably as we age. It could, it'll probably change considerably um, with our general health. So our, you know, our nutrition levels, our um, our lifestyle, that kind of thing. So I, I think it is. It's highly variable. Um, and I think there probably is a developmental profile that um, that we really don't know very well right now. So. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Cole. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>